everyone, today we're going to talk about cohort studies. Cohort studies are moderate on the um, strength of evidence, and so they're stronger than case control studies, but they're not considered as strong as the clinical trial. Cohort studies are observational studies, in other words, there isn't any randomization, and we don't control any intervention or risk factor exposure. Really, with a cohort study, what we're doing is we're taking a, a group of people called a cohort, and we're follow them, following them forward in time, looking at whether or not they're exposed to some type of outcome or to some type of uh, potential exposure status, and then we follow them forward in time to see if they end up with some sort of outcome of interest. Here's a little picture of what that looks like. So we look at in the beginning, whether they're exposed or not. In the beginning, we also have to make sure that they don't have the outcome of interest to begin with. For example, if we're looking at a certain type of diet, whether people are exposed to a certain type of diet or not, let's say Mediterranean diet, and we want to follow them forward to see if they get a certain type of cancer, let's say stomach cancer, we want to make sure that in the beginning, they don't already have the stomach cancer. And so we first have to assess them for the outcome to make sure they don't have it. And then we assess them for the exposure, whether they're being exposed or not. We follow them forward in time. And we compare whether or not they have cancer at certain time points along the timeline. So at the beginning of the study, all participants have to be at risk of developing the outcome of interest. So if we were interested in uterine cancer, let's say, we would have to make sure that we use only females in our study. And the subjects cannot have the outcome of interest at the beginning because then we've, when we follow them forward it wouldn't make any sense to see, well, do they end up with that if they had it in the beginning. One of the things that's really interesting about cohort studies is that when we look at um, an exposure status at the beginning of a study, sometimes there are certain exposure statuses that are grouped. For example, if we think of someone who is a um, smoker, we can overgeneralize and think of other factors or characteristics that might go along with being a smoker. Sometimes smokers uh, are people who don't exercise as much or who don't eat as well. And so if we're looking at does smoking lead to, let's say, stomach cancer, and we follow people forward in time, and let's say we do find that there's an association, we have to ask ourselves, is it really the smoking or is smoking a surrogate for some other factor that goes along with smoking, such as drinking or, or not eating as well? And so with cohort studies, sometimes it's difficult to know what truly is the factor that's leading to the outcome of interest because of this grouping of different characteristics um, at the start of the study. When we do cohort studies, we need to make sure that the, um, the investigator that's looking at exposure status and even outcome that they're blinded to all other things. We don't want someone to be measuring the different uh, characteristics of a patient or a subject if they know um, what might be the outcome or, or what they might be looking for or potentially finding. The other thing with blinding is that in cohort studies, subjects, they know if they're being exposed or not. They're the ones who are choosing to smoke or not smoke, to eat Mediterranean diet or not, uh, to drink or not, to exercise or not. They're the ones choosing it, so they're not blind to what they're being exposed to. They're actually in control of it. With cohort studies, as we follow people forward, sometimes one group is less likely to follow up than another group. For example, if we're looking at does drug use uh, lead to a higher association of acquiring HIV over time, 
and we find a group of people who are, are drug users, and we compare them to a group of people who are not drug users, and we follow them forward to see in the end, do they, you know, which group has a higher um, likelihood of having HIV, it's very difficult to follow drug users forward. Sometimes they're homeless or they move a lot. Uh, they might go in and out of rehab. It's harder to find people who have um, potentially embarrassing or illegal issues uh, that we would like to measure. And so one of the problems is if we can't follow people up uh, in all of the groups equally, then we don't really know what might have happened to that group if you know we're not able to follow them forward because perhaps they're doing so much better or perhaps they didn't make it. And so it might be an unfair comparison when we're comparing different groups and, and one has a higher rate of um, dropout. Some of the advantages of cohort studies are that you can calculate an incidence rate or a relative risk. These are uh, stronger rates than looking at prevalence or odds ratio. Another advantage is that we can look at many different exposures. And so if we're looking at the outcome of stomach cancer, we can look at several different exposures to different foods, processed foods, intake of vegetables or fruits, uh, perhaps different um, things that people drink, whether it be alcohol or milk or extra water. It's also good for rare exposures. So when we follow people forward, such as people who are exposed to, uh, let's say, the dust after 9-11, and we're interested in knowing, okay, did they end up with uh, respiratory diseases, cohort studies are the way to do that. The other thing is we can establish a good exposure to disease association. Because in the beginning, we're measuring what are they exposed to, and in the beginning, we know they do not have the disease. And so we presume that the exposure led to the disease, or at least is associated in that timeline. And finally, we don't withhold any treatment or exposure. Subjects, they're allowed to do whatever they want to do. So they're completely in charge. So it, does, it means that there aren't any... Um, as many ethical issues as there might be to the studies where people are randomized to receiving treatment and that's what they're mandated to get if they're in that study. And so in cohort studies, people are choosing for themselves. But we also have disadvantages of cohort studies. For example, in some cohort studies, there's six figures of people. There's 100,000 people in, in some cohort studies. And so sometimes we need a very large number of people in order to follow them forward and get an accurate incidence rate of disease in the end. Sometimes it's hard to find controls or people who aren't exposed to certain exposures. For example, if we're looking at does air pollution lead to uh, some sort of lung disease in Chicago, Who's not exposed to air pollution? <laughs> we might have to go to a place uh, maybe down south in, in southern Illinois in order to find people who aren't exposed to air pollution. But now those folks might be very different in terms of how they live and their lifestyle than people who live in Chicago. We also have a problem with dropout. In some of these studies, we have to follow people forward for as long as the latency period is. For example, if we're looking at the smoking leads to lung cancer, that can take 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so trying to follow people forward that long of time is sometimes very difficult to do. We also see exposure status changing. So if we're looking at, let's say, alcohol intake and that leading to something such as stomach cancer, Sometimes people drink more, sometimes they drink less. If we're looking at cigarette smoking, that might be an even better example. Sometimes smokers quit, and then they go back to smoking, and then they quit. I've seen this happen with friends. And so it's very difficult to 
determine what is their exposure status when it fluctuates over the years. The other thing that can change is diagnostic techniques. And so if we're looking at outcomes, let's say breast cancer, and we're using mammogram, but now we have breast MRI, it might look like suddenly there's this huge jump in the number of breast cancer cases. But really it's just that we have better equipment to find the cancer. And so having different diagnostic techniques over time, while it's good because we can then diagnose people in their early stages, it's difficult because then it's not as comparable as the earlier study, as the earlier um, time points. So cohort studies can go over many years, uh, which makes it very expensive and time consuming. And it's really not a very good study design for rare disease. If there's a disease where it's one in a million people get the disease and we follow a million people forward, we're only going to find perhaps one case. And so even if only one in 100,000 people get it, then we may have to have 500,000 people in the study or a million people in the study just to find a few cases. And so it's not a very good study design for rare diseases. So please let me know if you have any questions about cohort studies.